Right, OK. So, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as, I, as I say, I always kick off at three minutes past just because it makes a much more relaxed lecture um, without stragglers. So I hope you all had a good Easter break um, and you're ready and refreshed to uh, take the exams. So you've got effectively another two weeks of me. Um, so I get some lectures in now. So I get, we've got a lecture day, lecture I think on Thursday, example of class me. So you've got about another two weeks of me, basically, teaching you um, electronics. So Arthur's sort of taking a back seat from now on. I can hear a moment, ladies, ladies, sorry, ladies. So if you could, if you could leave that for after, that's great. Right, so I've actually got a cold, so I've, I'm, uh, if you, especially today, if you cannot talk whilst I'm talking, I'd be incredibly grateful. So this uh, lecture is called Lecture 16, Transistors Switching High Voltage Things On With A Low Voltage. So um, let's get straight to it. So here's an overview of today's lecture. I'm going to do no recap of the last lectures, because to be honest, I've got no idea what it's about. It's so long ago before Easter, you know, who knows. You can look back in the notes if you want, if you want to, and it's not, it's not very relevant to this lecture. Then we're going to look at transistors. Now, you've all, you should have all done transistors now in the lab and had like a little play with them and seen what they are and seen you know, these little, like, little black beady things and you've, you've drawn some sort of gain curves and things like that. So we're going to look at transistors today from a sort of a very different perspective. We're going to look at them effectively as a switch, as sort of a, an information switch. And uh, I'm going to chat through a few different types of um, transistors. So we'll look at transistor basics. So we're going to look at relays. So these are things, these aren't transistors, but you can think of them as transistors. I'm going to teach you about NPN transistors, PNP transistors, MOSFETs. I'm going to join sort of PNP, NPN transistors and MOSFETs together to make a, your first sort of uh, useful circuits, um, uh, transistor circuits into a push-pull pair. Um, and I'll tell you what it is. Now, um, I'll give you a bit of a warning before, um, before we get into this. So were you a physics student or electronic engineering student, this lecture would be about 10 credits worth of material and you'd be studying this whole semester long. And you'd do lots of maths, so it'd be incredibly complicated. Now, what I've designed this lecture to do is effectively give you the very, the very fundamentals of transistors. So you can go and use a transistor, you can go to the shop, buy a transistor, and use it after this lecture. You have some idea what it's all about, and you have like, enough knowledge to be able to use it. Um, but what this isn't, is this isn't like a semiconductor physics uh, course where I give you all the equations and everything. This is sort of a practical how-to guide for transistors. So everything here is actually useful and you, you, this is directly applicable for your projects. So, um, so I just want to mention, I don't know if everybody's aware of this, I don't know if you're aware of this, I've been putting all these lectures on YouTube. So if you're a revision, you want to watch me again, just put in um, MM2 EMD into YouTube and you'll get um, all the lectures and some of the example classes, not all of them, um, because some I didn't record. But, uh, so do use that if, if you want. The other thing is <coughs> I'm aware that the um, exams are coming up and you'd like all the notes. So if you look, so Arthur sort of on the top half of Moodle page, he's sort of, he's got folders and making it very organized. But if you scroll down to the bottom of the Moodle page, I've actually put all the lecture notes from last year. And they're basically identical to these lecture notes. So I think you've got three or four lectures left. Um, so if you scroll down, you'll find like the next three or four lectures, um, uh, you know, that I'm going to present. I haven't, normally I tweak the lectures before I give them, um, but that's sort of the basic core materials there. So if you want to read ahead, if you want to read ahead for the next three or four lectures to help you with your revision or whatever, uh, you'll find it all at the bottom of the Moodle page. So, but I, I may change it very slightly before I actually give it, give the notes this, um, give the lectures this time around. Okay, so transistor basics. Go. Transistor basics. So um, if you think back to lecture one, I sort of harped on about um, what electronics is and what, electro what electrical engineering is. I sort of made this very clear definition between what I'm teaching, which is sort of low voltage, clever electronics that make decisions basically, and what Arthur's teaching is sort of big, massive pieces of electrical machinery that do actual work, like this massive motor that might be that big. So there's this very clear distinction between the stuff that thinks, which is sort of low voltage, low current, and the stuff that doesn't think, that's high voltage, high current. And I sort of gave you this example of this robot where we have the top half doing the thinking, so that was the brains, and then the brawns are all these sort of legs and things, the motors that are doing the, um, the actual work. So this is electronic engineering and electrical engineering. Now, this lecture is sort of bridging a divide between electronic and electrical engineering. So it's how, this lecture is all about how to get your clever, intelligent circuit to control 
your dumb motor. So this is all sort of the link between this and that. So it's like the coupling of these two, these two subjects. So firstly, I'd just like you to think about electronics and electronic components. So I showed you this, this AND gate, I think it was, or it might be a NAND gate, I can't remember. And I, sh I said it's very, very small. And um, there's my biro on my, that I, I use to write things. And you can see that the chip's about the same size as the biro. It's very, very small, tiny, tiny device. Um, and this thing will deliver, at absolute best, about 25 milliamps at 5 volts. That's the absolute maximum this thing's going to give you. So, you know, very, very small amount of current, very, very small amount of voltage. But it actually gets much worse than that. So, so this thing, I'll just go back, this thing's called a, called a chip. And we all know what chips are, you know, we talk about them in the media and things, chips. This is also a chip. Now, the whole thing is not actually the silicon chip. So people refer to this as the chip. The actual chip bit of the chip is this bit in the center. Can you see that tiny black square in the center? So what this is on the right-hand side is somebody's got this chip, and they've literally poured acid on the top of it to etch out um, all the plastic. And what the acid has done is it's etched out this sort of plastic casing. And once it's got down to a certain level, it's revealed basically the actual silicon chip, which is that little black bit in the center. And what you can also see is the pins. So you can see sort of this, this leg here um, is, is connected to this um, silicon chip. And if you look really, really, really closely, so I'm going to go around here now. I've actually forgotten my laser pointer. If you, those of you who have got good eyesight who look really, really carefully, what you can actually see is you can see a tiny little wire, which is actually thinner. This is made of gold. It's about thinner than, thinner than the human hair. Connecting this leg, so this massive leg of the chip, to this actual silicon chip that's doing the actual thinking. And can you see how, how tiny this wire is? That wire is absolutely minute. So you think about how much electricity, how much, how much current and voltage you're going to get down a wire the size of a human hair. You know it's going to be negligible. So even, you know, trying to draw 25 milliamps out of that tiny little wire, you know, you're going to be pushing that tiny little wire. And it's going to just burn if you're not very careful. Okay, so that's inside the chip. So the point is, chips are tiny, delicate things can't give you much power. Now, think about this motor now. So think about this motor. This motor is about that big. You know, it can be bigger. It can be the size of the room, maybe. Absolutely massive thing. And the wires you put into this motor might be about the size of your thumb, okay? Or maybe the size of your arm if it's a really, really high voltage, high, high current um, cable. So we've got a sort of problem here that's emerging. We've got our clever electronics. So this, with its tiny wires, and we've got our massive motor that needs driving with nice big fat wires. So somehow we've got to couple, we've got to sort of step up the voltage and current from our tiny clever electronics to our massive motor. Okay? So we can imagine the sort of scenario we're trying to drive this thing with our tiny chip. Um, this thing needs, you know, hundreds of amps, hundreds of volts. This thing can deliver nothing. So what happens when we try and drive it? The chip sets on fire. It just won't work. No chance, absolutely no chance of driving a big motor with a tiny chip. So what we need, what we actually need, is some type of amplifier box. Okay? So what happens is we've got our tiny little voltage on the left-hand side, tiny little current, goes into some type of amplifier box. So here I've just drawn it as a red box, and we'll go into what that red box is later. We've got, then this amplifier box has got massive wires connecting it to the motor, so the amplifier can sort of drive this big current and this big load to our uh, uh, voltage to our, to our motor. So in this, in this way, by having this amplifier box, we can couple, in effect, our low voltage circuit to our high voltage circuit. So this whole lecture is, in effect, about what goes in that sort of that step-up box. And this is very important because if in your project, for example, you, have a, you want to use a Raspberry Pi or some type of microprocessor, even if you don't want to power a big motor, so if you, if you want to power a moderate-sized motor about the size of my fist, you're still going to have to step up the voltage because your clever electronics just won't have the input in it to actually power motors. So, so the first thing I want to look at is something called relays. Um, now, relays are like a, they're very important because they're used a lot still in industry. Um, and you know, uh, I was actually looking at Arduino. Uh, board for uh, controlling a buggy that had relays on it. They're very old devices, but they're very useful, but they're quite a nice device, so I thought I'd tell you about them. So, these are sort of mechanical transistors. So this is a relay. <coughs> what it is, is it's a box. So here's the box. And then in this box, it's got 
an electromagnet. So just like what Arthur's been teaching about, it's got literally a bar of iron with a coil wrapped around it, some wire. And then on the end of this bar, it's got a little switch. And what happens is the following. So we rig it up like this. So we've got our sort of, on one side we might have very low voltage, on the other side we might have some massive motor. So this is how it works. Here's what happens is we switch on the low voltage side. So, so I'll go around the other side actually so I can point. Very good. So what we do is this is all our low voltage side. So this is like connected to our microprocessor or something like that. We switch this on, and I, I represent our microprocessor with just a power source, very, very small power source. We switch on our, our low voltage uh, power source. So the current flows around here, all the way around here, through the switch, through this electromagnet, and back down. Okay? And then what this generates is this generates a magnetic field in our electromagnet. And this magnetic field pulls this switch shut here. So literally, it's physically closed the switch. And because now we've completed this circuit with our high voltage motor can be driven, so lots of current can flow around this circuit and the motor goes. So what we've done is we've basically stepped up, in effect, a sort of a small, or used a very, very small voltage to drive or switch on a very, very big voltage. And in principle, there's no limit to how, um, you know, how, how big a voltage you can switch on with this. So in, in the national grid, they're, they're not called relays, but there are sort of mechanical switches that get switched on and off physically by a, low, a lower voltage source. So you can, you can switch on and off kilovolts like this. Any questions so far? Sh please shout. If anything's like mysterious, just say, I don't understand. Very happy to uh, go back over it. No? Good. And then, of course, when you open this switch, so this is in the on state, when we open this switch, the, this current disappears, this magnetic field goes away, and then what next happens is this, this switch pops open, the motor turns off. So we've got complete control using the low voltage, and we control the high voltage. And we can control all sorts of things with relays. And the sort of very old device, they're one of the very, very first sort of, uh, one of the very first devices invented in electronics. But they're very useful today. Um, I'll go over that in a minute. So we can drive, you know, these Arduinos and gates. We can connect these through our ele electromagnet. And we can turn on exact, you know, whatever we want. You know, even the power to the whole building, we can turn on and off using a relay. And here's a relay actually in, a in action. So this is what you actually get when you order a relay from RF. <coughs> so here we've got two inputs. So this is for the, the current to drive the... Uh, to drive the electromagnet. So here's the electromagnet with all, all its copper wire wrapped around it. And then we, this one sort of, here's, here's, the, here's the, the sort of the, a piece of metal that's pulled down that will let go. And this sort of drives um, some type of contact here. And we can switch on and off between here. And here's it's sort of a clearer one. So here we've got our coil, and we've got some type of switch being pulled in and out. And you, these things, I don't know, that's maybe two or three centimeters high. The smallest you can get them is about, I don't know, about as big as your thumb, you know, they're quite big. Uh, there's other disadvantages to them in a minute that we'll, we'll go through. So the really good thing about relays um, is that you get actual physical isolation between your low voltage side and your high voltage side. So you can see actually here, there's an air gap. There's an actually an air gap. Your high voltage circuit is not connected to, to your low voltage circuit. They're totally separate. So this means you, ha you have loads and loads of dangerous voltage on this side and you've got air, and the air is separating you and your Raspberry Pi or whatever from this high voltage. So they're quite a safe device. So when you want actual physical isolation from something dangerous, you want to say, I don't want to be connected to that high voltage source, relays are pretty good for this. They're quite a safe, a safe device to separate you. Um, and they were the primary way, basically, to turn on and off things before transistors. Now, what don't I like about relays? Well, there's lots of disadvantages to relays, um, and that's why they're not used lots. So <coughs> if you want the thing to be on, you've got to pass current through your coil, okay? So you've got to constantly put a current through it, and the current's quite big in, in the scheme of things. It's, you know, it's a few milliamps. It's significant, especially if you're trying to run your device off a battery that's got a finite amount of current that you can deliver. So they're always drawing current when you want it on, which is sort of a disadvantage. And because of this, they always use a lot of power. Okay, so relays are not very good for battery operation because you know they, they eat power. And the mechanical devices, and as I, I think I told you 
a while ago, all mechanical devices are slow because, you know, mechanical objects take a time to move. That switch is a piece of copper or metal that's got some type of sort of inertia, so you've got to accelerate it, deaccelerate it. It's got to move. So it's a slow device. It can turn on and off in maybe under a second, um, but not, we're not talking like microseconds. So they're pretty slow. And they're full of copper, and they're heavy, and they cost lots of money, and they're big. So they're quite handy, but, you know, probably not for a portable device. Um, you know. So this is sort of a, an aside. So before we had transistors, we actually used uh, relays to do lots of complicated operations and switching. And here's an here's a old telephone exchange um, full of relays to sort of switch the calls between wherever you want the calls to go. So you're actually doing quite complicated things with relays um, that we don't bother to do anymore these days because we've got transistors. Okay. Now then, before we leave relays, is there anything else anyone wants to ask about them? Any burning questions? No? Okay, right. So, they're handy. Handy tool to have in your bag for doing engineering. Now we're going to move on to transistors. So these are sort of the, the modern alternative to relays. But, you know, um, and they're used generally more, um, more today than relays. But, um, you know, relays do still have their place. So we're going to firstly look at NPN bipolar transistors. Now it sounds like a very scary word. But it's not. Just, I'm just going to present this all in pictures so it'll be quite easy to understand. So here's our relay on the left-hand side. And <coughs> we've got a control current. So effectively, we pass a current through the, through, the, through the electromagnet. The current goes out. And we can use this control current to turn on and off our device. And then we have an input from our, our high-voltage side, um, which goes through the switch and to the um, low-voltage side. So this has got four terminals. Now, a transistor, um, which you will probably all recognize from the labs, I've shown on the right-hand side. And it's also got control wires going in. So here we've got a big, a big control wire with the current actually standing on the side of the board. <coughs> I had my laser pointer confiscated at Luton Airport, so I've uh, got the mouse. Um, <coughs> so, so we've got control current coming in, and this can switch on and off the current that comes, flows between the input and the output. So it's just like the relay... So, so low voltage side, high voltage side, low voltage side, high voltage side. So you, you know, your, your current from your Arduino or whatever would come in here, and you put, stick your big motor here. And we're going to go through that now, exactly what will happen. So I, I drew this for you in the lab, and this is actually a very famous cartoon. So people that originally drew this are called Howitzer Hill, and they've written a very good book called The Art of Electronics. And this is all my, my take on, on the famous Transistor Man cartoon. So the idea of a transistor is effectively you've got a control wire. Okay, so this is, in the previous picture, effectively this wire here. And what you do is you put in a very small current in this control wire. And you can think of that sort of effectively being a meter on this control wire. Sorry. That's all right. Skype. <laughs> um, and you've got this big, fat... Uh, sort of effectively current you're trying to control. So you can imagine what happens is the transistor man sits in your transistor, so you can imagine him actually sat, whoops, imagine him actually sat in there like a fairy, and he's always monitoring the current that's flowing into the control pin. And when he sees um, no current on the control pin, then he shuts this valve and no current can flow in the, in the, main, in the main sort of, um, you know, no current can flow through the output and input pin. Then when you put a very, very small amount of current on the control pin, he looks at this and goes, oh, you put a bit of current on the, on the control pin, I'll open the, main, the valve to the main pipe a bit more. So he opens this, and lots of current sort of gushes through. And you can see the current that's going through this main pipe here is much bigger than the small control current we put in. So we've got an amplifier, in effect. Then, then we increase the control current a little bit more. So a bit more control current goes in. The transistor man sees that we've put more control current in, so he opens the valve much more, and the valve opens, and he lets in much, much, much more water. So you can see, again, we're letting through, through from the input to the output pin, much more current than we're putting in to the control pipe, or pin, or, or whatever you call it. So this is sort of a, a water stroke current analogy. Now, um, whoops. <coughs> uh, the correct words for these pins are the base. So the base is like the pin that controls how much, how much current flows between the input and output pin. And the correct term 
for the input pin is called the collector, and the correct term for the output pin is called the emitter. So you control the current with the base, and it controls the current flow between the collector and the emitter. So that's the, that's the correct technical term that you should probably know. Okay? Any questions about transistor man? Be happy to answer any questions. Nope? Okay, well do, I won't ask again, just shout if you want me to, don't go over anything again. Just shout, because it's getting a bit harder. So, in sort of transistor terms, if we sort of redraw trans transistor man, but in actual um, transistor format, um, <coughs> when there's no current going to the base pin, no current flows between the collector and emitter. When there's a bit of current going to the base pin, we get quite a lot of current flowing between the collector and emitter. When we put a bit more current in the base pin, we get a lot of current flowing between the base and emitter. So it's basically an amplifier. Okay. Um, and here are the three guys who invented it in sort of 19, I don't know, 40, 50. Um, and there they are there with their, with their tr transistor invention. And um, they're quite interesting guys if you want to read about them. Some, some not so pleasant. But anyway, um, <coughs> here are typical transistors you might find today. So the big top one is probably some type of power device that you might, might find in the power supply. Um, then a couple of smaller transistors. And that one right at the bottom there is something that might be integrated into a mobile phone to turn off. You, know, it's, you can see it's a much, much smaller package. They've always got three legs, and they always come and look a bit like that. So the really good things about transistors over relays is that they've got, no, they've got no moving parts. They've got no mechanical parts. They're just a solid state device. Nothing moves, nothing changes, which means basically they don't wear out. You know, if you're driving them properly at the correct voltages and currents they're designed for, they're probably never going to break. Um, they don't need as much current to turn on as a relay. So they use sort of 10 times, 20 times less current than a relay. Um, so you can, you, know, you can quite happily put these in sort of a battery powered device and it won't last only 10 minutes. And they're absolutely, literally cheap as chips, okay? So they're very, very cheap devices. Now, if you, if you look in, um, if you look in books about transistors, you'll see, when you open a page, it says what type of transistors are there? There's literally hundreds of types of transistors. So I've drawn a few different types of transistors here. And they're all sort of work on the same principle. Um, and then when you get into power electronics, there's sort of complicated types of transistors that you, you join together to make transistors with more characteristics, better characteristics. And um, I'm going to focus on like three that I think are important for you to know. So I'm not going to sort of you know, make your life complicated by asking you to remember all those. I just want you to be aware there's lots of different types of transistors. And it's sort of horses for courses. It depends which one you want to pick. So I'm going to teach you about, in this lecture, three. So I'm going to talk, talk to you about an N-channel MOSFET. I'm going to talk to you about um, an NPN and a PNP bipolar transistor. So the, if you know about these, you can get through most problems. It's sort of like the, you know, it's, yeah, it's sort of, sort of get out of jail free card transistors. If you know about these, great. So let's move on to NPN bipolar transistors. So <coughs> do you remember from the diodes lecture no, I'm going to try. I think I put the slide right at the back. There we go. Do you remember from the diodes lecture? I told you about these diodes that had these materials of n-type and p-type material, and they're made of silicon. And I sort of labelled some some parts of them had positive charge, some parts of them had negative charge. Well, let's go back up. If you look at a transistor, they're made of the same materials. It's all exactly the same technology that we use to fabricate diodes. It's all the piece of material with positive charge, piece of material with negative charge. And the NPN transistor, thanks. The NPN transistor has a layer of negative charge, N, a layer of positive charge, P, and a layer of negative charge, N. That's why it's called the NPN transistor. And I've sort of drawn a physical picture of it here and the, um, the sort of the, the schematic on the right. And you can see the base current or the control current comes into this layer with the pos which is positive. And the collector and the emitter, so the input and output, basically come into the negative, uh, uh, negative material and come out of negative material. So that's sort of the physical picture of it. Now, I'm not going to dive into this. I just want you to be aware of where the name comes from and why they're called this. Because, um, you know, if, if you're a, a... Ladies, could you... Ladies? Sorry. Ladies? Thanks. It's quite really distracting when you talk. Thank you. Um, 
I just want you to be aware of where the name comes from. And if, you were, if we were doing a semiconductor physics course, this would be the, the, the base of like 10 lectures. So I just, that's all I want you to know. So this is the principle of uh, how you use an NTN tra transistor. So here we've got a light bulb on the right-hand side. And it's connected to a 20-volt source. And between the 20-volt source and zero volts, we've put the transistor. So this transistor is acting as the switch. Okay? Then what happens is we control this base current with a very, very small voltage and current. So at the moment, everything's off. And when, what happens is when we, have, when we close the switch, like this, current flows through this, this, this uh, battery here into the base of the transistor. The transistor turns on and then lets through a much bigger current. Okay, so we've, again, just like the relay, we've turned on a big current, the big voltage, so 20 volts in this case, with a small voltage. So this is basically how you use a transistor. And again, if we, if we turn the base current off, the transistor goes off and current stops flowing in our circuit. So we can now control, without any moving parts, a big voltage and a big current with a small voltage and a small current. So we can effectively connect anything we want on the left-hand side, so literally logic gates, um, Raspberry Pi, whatever, to the left-hand side of our circuit, and we can drive whatever we want on the right-hand side. Now, I sort of, sort of bent the truth when I told you about relays, in that relays are actually, they, they use, you can power them directly from chips and Raspberry Pis, but they, they require a little bit more uh, current quite often than your Raspberry Pi can drive. So if you do want to use a relay, what I would suggest doing, um, this, is, this won't be an example, but what I suggest doing is using a transistor to power the relay and then use the relay to switch on a, a big current. So if you want to, you know, that, uh, that air isolation, um, and you want to turn it off easily, I, I would use a transistor to power the relay. Anyway, so this is um, NPN transistors. So that's all very good. Any questions so far about this? Happy to, happy to go over stuff? Okay. So, in summary, you put in a current, positive voltage, into the input of the NPN transistor, it turns on. And you take it away, it turns off. Now, we're going to do PNP transistors. And you can probably guess what the structure of a PNP transistor is like um, already. So, this is the structure of the PNP transistor. It's got a layer of positive material, negative material, and positive material, hence the name PNP. And we put current in the base to turn it on. Okay? So it's just like the NPN, but a different structure. So positive, negative, positive. And if you also notice, the arrow is actually different. So if you look very carefully, this arrow is coming in from the top there, and the other one, the arrow is going out. So you actually identify them on a circuit diagram as to which one's which. Now, this is the clever bit. The special thing about PNP transistors is they act quite differently to NPN transistors. Now, they, they only turn on when the input is switched off, okay? So it's the opposite of a, of a NPN. So a PNP transistor only turns on when the input is set to sort of zero volts and there's no current flowing into it. And they only switch off when you connect the input to a positive voltage. So it's sort of the, it's, you can think of it a bit like a knock gate. It's like the opposite of the NPN. So watch this. When we connect the input of the PNP transistor to zero volts, what happens is the following. Go around here. What happens is the following. Current comes down, a very small amount of current comes down from a 20 volt source, comes through our, our, our transistor and goes to zero volts. So this is connected to zero, okay? And because of this very small amount of current flowing sort of through the transistor this way, the transistor goes on and the bulb lights. So the input here is connected to zero volts and it's off. Okay, that's the opposite of the NPN transistor where, go back, where you connect the input to a positive voltage, a little battery, and it goes on. Okay? So one turns on when you put a positive voltage on it, the other turns 
on when you put a negative, a zero voltage on there. Okay? Clear? Anybody not clear? Yeah? Everybody happy? How about the guy in the blue shirt with the glasses? Are you happy? Fantastic. Thumbs up. That's what I like to hear. <laughs> right. So, you have a question. What's the question? Yeah. It'll only go on when it's connected to zero. That's, that's, the pa that's the high power supply. That's the high power supply. The high, high voltage supply. Okay? Right. So, that's what our light turns on when we connect the input to zero volts. Okay? Now, there's a reason I'm telling you about these different types of transistors. You might, you might, you might think, um, oh, why are you telling me about these different types of transistors? But they're very useful in a circuit we're going to talk about in a minute. So, so in summary, the PNP transistor will turn on when it's connected to zero, and will turn, whoops, and it will turn off when it's not connected to zero. Okay. Now then. So, I think I've laboured this point. But I'm just going to go through it one, whoops, one more time. So we've got these two opposites. Left-hand side turns on when you put a positive voltage on it. Right-hand side turns on when you put a zero voltage on it. Okay. Now, what are the advantages of, of, be, of these types of transistors? So they can turn on very quick, very off, off and on very quickly. So they can turn off so quickly that you can actually use them to amplify radio signals. So radio signals go off and on at megahertz or gigahertz. So these types of transistors are very, very so quick, you, they can turn on and off in, you know, a nanosecond, basically. That's much, much quicker than a relay, which is, you know, not, uh, 10 to 9 slower. Very, very low cost. You know, in, in your, these, tra these transistors will be integrated into circuits, your mobile phone. Your mobile phone is going to have millions of these, these devices in it. Um, super low cost, really the cheapest chips. Now, the disadvantage of these devices is that they need a bit of a current to keep them switched on. So if you want to main maintain your, your transistor being switched on, you've constantly got to feed current in one end or current from out the other end. Right? You must put current in it for it to operate. You might think, well, so what? The thing is, though, if, you de if your device is running off a battery you know, and you want it to last all day, you can't keep drawing current because if you, if you, when you draw current, your battery runs down. So, this isn't a very good device for mobile applications. It's not very good. Y your computer doesn't, your, your CPU won't have these in it um, because they continually um, draw current, which is uh, bad. They're more used for you know, RF applications. They're not also not so good at switching high currents, such as running motors. So I'm now going to look at a device that's a different type of transistor that's specifically designed, A, not to draw current when it's switched on, or switched off. It only draws current when you're changing the state. The other type, the other good uh, thing about this next type of transistor is they're very good at driving motors. So when you have a project, a uh, motor in your next, um, when you have a motor in your in your project, the next type of transistor is quite a good transistor to drive it with. So these are called MOSFETs, and it stands for. You don't need to know this. Metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor. You don't need, you don't need to know that. Now. <coughs> I'm going to take you through the structure of a MOSFET and how they work. Now, you might think, oh, I'm not an electrical engineer. I don't need to know this. The reason I'm doing this is because there's a few funny characteristics about the MOSFET that you must know about if you want to use them. Otherwise, you'll come unstuck. So I'm going to tell you in picture form how they work, and then you'll be able to figure out what, what the problems are when using them. So this is what a MOSFET looks like. So here on the right-hand side, we've got some type of high-power high um, device, like our motor. So I've drawn it as a light bulb. 20 volts, very high voltage. And we connect it to our MOSFET. And this is the MOSFET. It looks a bit of a different structure to our other types of transistors. And the power comes in and it go gets connected to a positive area of silicon. So a P-type silicon. And the, the other end that comes out is also connected to a positive area of silicon. So this has got positive charge in it. And between it, we've just got some silicon that's got no charge. Okay, it's got, it's got not, no positive charge no negative charge. And the current state, nothing can happen. So no current flows. Now I'm going to show you how we turn this transistor on. So to turn this transistor on, what we do is firstly, so this is obviously made for you, you've got to give it some contacts. So you put
put two pieces of literally metal, so aluminium or copper or something like that, on each side. So we have one piece of metal here and one piece of metal here. Okay, so this is literally just aluminium. Does this, do these pieces of metal like that remind you of anything? What's that remind you of? Two pieces of metal like that. Capacitor, yeah? That's very important. That, that will come in a minute. Now, what we do to turn it on is we take two wires and we apply a voltage between the right plate and the left plate. So we apply like one volt or something like that. And then what we do is we turn on the switch, current flows, and we effectively charge this capacitor. And what happens when we charge the capacitor? We get, we get charge on the plates, right? Now, look what we've got. Now, what we've got is we've got this area of positive charge, we've got this area of positive charge, and what we've done is we filled this area here that had, whoops, whoops, that's not what I wanted. There we go. We filled this, this area here that had no charge in it previously with a little layer of charge. So we've like filled this gap up of, with charge by charging the capacitor. Okay. Now, because of this, we've now got continuous charge between here and here. And what can happen now is we've effectively closed the circuit. So now, charge can flow from our big high voltage source all around the circuit, through here, through here, through here, and back round. So our, our, our MOSFET is now turned on. Okay? So this is how we turn on a MOSFET. Then, when we want to turn it off, all we do, open the switch, and what happens very slowly is this charge here and here dissipates. So it's gone. So this charge has dissipated. And then our external circuit is turned off. So by using the capacitor, in effect, we've turned the MOSFET. Or we've, we've filled this channel with charge and it conduct or not conduct. Any questions on that? Any questions? So this is like, if you're a physicist, we'd spend lots more time on this. But this is just like enough so you know what the problems with MOSFETs are. Is that a question there, guys? No? No? Okay. So MOSFETs are fantastic at driving motors. Brilliant at driving high power motors. Now, the other thing with MOSFETs, as you may have realized, is they only take charge when you switch them on or off. So when you, when you, apply, when you generate this charge on the channels, it'll need that current to come from the battery. But when it's switched on, it won't need any more current because it'll just stay on, okay? just like a capacitor. It takes charge while still charging it up. Now, the problem with MOSFETs, the big problem with MOSFETs, is they are a capacitor. Okay? So capacitors take a time to charge. You've got to get that charge from the battery into the capacitor, and it takes, you know, capacitors can take, I don't know if any of you have used a you know, big camera with a proper flash gun. If you, if you press the button, then you can hear the capacitor charge. It goes, and it charges up the capacitor. And you, you've got to wait maybe a second or two seconds before you can take your next shot with your, with your camera. Um, and that's just because it takes charge time to get the charge from the battery um, into the capacitor. And it's the same with MOSFETs. Getting this charge onto the, onto the contacts takes a time. It takes you know, a, a noticeable amount of time. And um, they're a bit slow, therefore they're a bit slow. Much slower than um, the other type of transistor we looked at previously. Okay. Now, also, another problem is these chips can't deliver much charge. They can deliver tiny amounts of charge. So if you want this chip to turn on and off this MOSFET really, really quick, it's not going to be able to. It'll turn it on, but it might take a bit of time to turn it on or off. And, you know, we're talking about, I don't know, milliseconds? It's, it's, just not, it's, not, it's not super quick. If your motor's spinning around, you know, 1,000 revolutions a minute or something, it's probably not quick enough to fire the coil. So... <coughs> oh, this is what a MOSFET looks like in pictorial form. And you see, actually, it looks a bit like a capacitor. Right, that's actually the, the diagram for it. Now, push-pull pairs to drive MOSFETs. So what we're going to do is we're now going to join the first type of transistor, these bipolar transistors, together with MOSFETs and form our first like, sophisticated transistor circuit. And we're going to use these... Um, these very quick transistors to push and pull charge into our MOSFETs to make them turn on and off quickly. So we sort of 
get the, the benefits of having very quick turn on and turn off times and the advantage of having the MOSFETs, which is effectively, um, they can be used to power big motors. So we're now going to look at push-pull pair. So, what type of transistor can turn on and off very quickly? A, uh, a bipolar junction transistor is the answer. Now, so we, on the left, we've got transistors that can turn on very quickly. And on the right, we've got a transistor that's very good at handling big current, very big currents for motors and things like that. So we're going to combine transistors on the left and the transistor on the right to form a circuit that can operate very, very quickly. And we're going to use these transistors to basically force charge in and out of this MOSFET very, very quickly so, so it can react much more quickly than it would if we connected it directly to a microprocessor. So, what's this look like? This is called the push-pull pair circuit for driving MOSFETs. And it's a very useful circuit. So if there's only one circuit you remember from this course, this is immensely useful because it means once you know this, you can connect uh, microprocessors to very high voltage sources and drive them on and off very, very quickly. Incredibly useful for driving things like motors. So what we've got is we've got a PNP transistor and NPN transistor. We've got one transistor that turns on when there's a positive voltage applied and one transistor that turns on when there's zero voltage applied. So, if you just stick with me for the next five minutes, it'll be really clear. So, what happens? To turn this on, what happens is we put one volt into the base of both of these transistors, okay? The NP tr N transistor turns on and the PNP transistor turns off, okay? With me so far, yeah? Now, what happens is charge flows from the positive rail through the NPN transistor into the gate of the MOSFET. Now note, we've connected the, this gate of this MOSFET to a really high voltage, so the cur this current's going to really get, that get you know, jammed in that gate really, really quickly. And notice it's coming from the high voltage supply, not our wee little microprocessor. So we basically connect the gate of our MOSFET to a massive voltage to get lots of current in there really, really quickly, okay? So what happens is once the charge has charged our MOSFET, the light bulb go goes on, circuit operates, okay? So we've, this is a way of turning the MOSFET on really quickly. Now, for turning it off, what we do is we put a zero volt, zero volts on the input to our, our, our pair of transistors. Then, the NPN transistor goes off, the PNP transistor goes on, and then what happens, this is very important, all this charge that was sitting on the gate of our MOSFET get sucked out through this transistor straight to zero volts. And note, this charge is not being sucked out through our weedy little microprocessor on the left. It's being taken directly to the zero volt rail. So we're really sucking that charge out of, out of the MOSFET. So this process happens very, very quickly. So what this is, is sort of a way of effectively, efficiently connecting the gate of the MOSFET to a positive or a zero volts and getting that charge in and out incredibly quickly. Uh, any questions on that? Any questions on that? Very happy to answer questions. No? If there's anything that's not clear, it'll be on, on YouTube later, so you can re replay me and uh, even come to my office. Yeah, so very, very handy way of driving any big load. Learn this circuit. If this is one circuit you learn for your career, learn this one. It's brilliant. It's got me out of loads of problems. Okay? So, there's one last thing I'd like you to do. You can